Good evening. Good evening. I'm Beverly Wheeler, president of the Alumni Association. I'm pleased to be here to introduce a distinguished alumnus who present this evening's talk entitled My Path from Carnegie Mellon University to Academic Medicine, Dr. Hillard Lazarus. Dr. Lazarus is a tenured professor, full professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University, and he practices at University Hospital's Case Medical Center in the Division of Hematology Oncology, where he was director of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Program for more than 25 years, and currently serves as director of Novel Cell Novel Cell Therapies, University Hospital's Case Medical Center, Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. He led a sustained and innovative clinical and translational research program focused on chemotherapy dose escalation and blood and marrow transplantation for improving therapy of malignant disorders. His seminal impact in multiple aspects of transplantation was recognized in 1986 by his invitation to develop and chair the Blood and Marrow Transplant Committee of the National Cancer Institute funded Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, a position he held until 2003. For the past decade, he has been the principal investigator of the case consortium of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network, an organization funded by the National Cancer Institute and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. These groups provide national leadership in the development of a new clinical trials for blood and marrow transplantation for the treatment of leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma, and aplastic anemia. Dr. Lazarus is internationally recognized for his contributions in the areas of mesenchymal stem cell transplantation, autologous blood and marrow transplantation for lymphoma, and allogeneic blood and marrow transplantation for malignancies. These efforts included the development of many new anti-cancer therapies and sophisticated supportive care technologies. He has been identified as an outstanding physician in many regional and national surveys and was inducted into the Cancer Care Hall of Fame, American Cancer Society. He has over 400 publications and is an editor of six textbooks in the field of blood and bone marrow transplantation, hematologic malignancies, and supportive care for cancer patients. He has been a gifted teacher and mentor to countless medical residents, fellows, and junior faculty, influencing many to pursue careers in academic medicine, including blood stem cell transplantation. Please join me in welcoming 2011 Alumni Distinguished Achievement Award honoree, Dr. Hillard Lazarus. Thank you very much for that terrific introduction. Um, I hope I can keep you uh, engaged and awake uh, while I tell you about my experiences. And I would like to begin by saying that I'm very humbled that I was chosen for this award and my most sincere thanks for all the folks at you at Carnegie Mellon for giving me such a wonderful education and helping with my, uh, my life's experiences. I wanted to say uh, some things about myself and my experiences at Carnegie Mellon before I tell you about what I have done with my career as a result of my training here. And I, would start with my first slide basically telling you what my passions are. Uh, certainly my family and my wife is here sitting in the front row along with my, uh, my parents and my aunt and uncle. Uh, I'm also passionate about uh, and a sore loser about dealing with cancers. I was hoping and I will show you some data where we've really pushed back the frontiers of these dreaded diseases. But my passions also include Carnegie Mellon University as you'll hear and of course, the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm a Pittsburgh person and 
never miss a game. This is um, my, my, uh, my wife who's sitting in the front row, my love of my life and my best friend. And this is uh, one of our uh, family get-togethers at a recent uh, family wedding. And you can see that's very important to me. Uh, I've been very blessed by having great medical mentors. Uh, these three gentlemen are internationally recognized. Um, this gentleman, Birch Griggs, was a professor at the University of Rochester where I obtained my, uh, undergrad, my uh, medical degree. And then the man who invented the science of blood coagulation, Oscar Ratnoff at Case Western. And finally, uh, Nathan Berger, who is uh, a currently a former dean and cancer center director at, uh, director at Case, who have provided me with uh, great insight, valuable advice, and great inspiration. Now, if you look at this uh, book, this is a, a book on the bestseller of the New York Times, Outliers, The Story of Success by Malcolm Gladwell. And in this text, he describes a lot of things that lead to success in life. And one of them is luck. But I don't think it's uh, luck that I ended up at Carnegie Mellon. I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. Um, and I would maybe it's more fate that I ended up at Carnegie Mellon. But I can say that in my life, this time I spent here was among the greatest uh, uh, period of, of my life. Some of the best years here uh, on this campus. This is um, the mug for my fraternity, and I have a fraternity brother in the audience. Um, our fraternity's morphed a little bit. It's still on the campus. Um, but this is where I developed a lot of camaraderie and, and leadership. I got to do a lot of things in the, internal, uh, in the intramural athletics program. And as a student on this campus, uh, all the great things that we have to do, the homecoming floats and the homecoming is this week, the booths at Spring Carnival, the, um, the, the Greek sing, uh, the parties, the mixers. This is a great, great uh, e educational experience, but it's also a great social experience for students. And this is uh, uh, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I would uh, argue that for Carnegie Mellon, I think the, the logo should have we can do as part of the, uh, uh, the mantra because I think that's part of the culture here. And I'll show you uh, that as I go through my presentation. Um, I was very fortunate early in my campus experience to uh, have two uh, Carnegie Mellon mentors who put me on the path to my success. Uh, much like the, uh, the men I showed you from the uh, University of Rochester and then Case Western Reserve University. And photographs of these gentlemen from uh, the past are shown here, uh, George Bullarello and Tin Ken Hung. And these gentlemen uh, began a fledgling biotechnology department. In the, uh, it was a subunit of, of uh, uh, civil engineering. And they were working on very f uh, tr uh, interesting projects in... Um, Blood, blood, uh, red blood cells and, and circulation and other things. And I got very interested and I decided I wanted to apply engineering to medicine and that's in fact how I've spent my entire career. They were instrumental in helping me uh, as an undergraduate student connect up with a surgeon over at West Penn Hospital and the more I was exposed to medicine, the more I realized how great medicine was and why I wanted to put my uh, training into uh, medicine. These two gentlemen also were very helpful getting me into medical school because I, if I was not the first Carnegie Mellon student who made it to medical school, I certainly was one of the first. This was something that was somewhat unheard of and in fact is one of the reasons why I say we can do because whenever I ask for help they were, would bend over backwards and make sure that all of the uh, necessary things happen. I had an occasion to see Tin Kang Hung uh, recently He's, at the, he's in bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh, and he's still a very active uh, researcher. And he has, um, again, continued to be a, a guiding light for me. The things that I learned at Carnegie Mellon, I think, are, are shown in this slide. These are traits that most of us have in some form, but they were enhanced here. Uh, the work-study ethic. How to think critically and solve problems. That's what engineers and applied scientists do. We have to work together. And now the buzzword, as you know, is, is networking. I don't think that word really existed, but that's what we did. 
And we also reveled in the discovery and learning things. I mean, it was a very passionate, exciting uh, time to be a student here. And all of these things have helped uh, shape me as who I am. And I, I have carried this we can do philosophy uh, throughout my career. And when I come back to visit at Carnegie Mellon, it's more pronounced than ever. Uh, I did want to tell you about getting into medical school and uh, what I have done with my medical career. Um, as you heard from the introduction, um, I uh, wanted to um, deal with patients that had malignancies and at the time I started, um, malignancies, there weren't very many drugs, there weren't very many effective surgical approaches and most patients did not do well. That's clearly not the case anymore. And it's like seeing a man on, getting a man on the moon or the Berlin Wall coming down in your lifetime to see so many phenomenal uh, successes in such a short time is greatly rewarding. I've been able to be productive enough to have a, a, a rank of professor at a major medical center, and I've been able to not only uh, lead and uh, 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 give guidance to a, a marrow transplant program, but I've been able to, uh, to work with young people and help them uh, f uh, get into a career in medicine, which I think is really one of our goals and I think is often uh, uh, overlooked in this area of bean counting. So what I'm going to show you in the, in the remaining part of my talk is what I have done, and I hope this is presented in a way that you can understand it because it's, uh, a lot of this is, uh, is, is shop talk and I don't want it to be that way. My area of expertise is in dealing with uh, blood disorders. And this is what's called a blood smear. This is when you take a drop of blood and you smear it on a slide and you stain it and you see different cells that have names. These uh, purple things are uh, white blood cells that fight infection. The red things are red blood cells that carry oxygen. And these little things are called platelets and they're critical to, to making blood clot when we, uh, when we have an injury. They're made in the factory. The factory is called the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is the inside of a bone. If you go to a skeleton and hold up a bone, it's hollow. But if you go to a butcher shop and you look at a bone that's been cut in half, it's filled with red material that we call bone marrow. And this is a, these photomicrographs, these are pictures of, the micros, uh, of what the, the bone marrow looks like. These are very, very small cells and there's, they're very rich with cells, as you can see, but there's also these big open spaces that are, um, are, are, uh, are filled with fat. And so that's what a normal bone marrow looks like. It's relatively cellular. When people get chemotherapy to get rid of cancer, um, there are different kinds of cancers. Some of the cancers are more sensitive to chemotherapy, shown on this uh, curve as a, the orange uh, curve that's, uh, that's um, more chemotherapy kills more cancer. You have fewer cells, but many cancers are relatively insensitive. And even if you give her higher doses of treatment, you don't get rid of the cancer. The other problem is that when you give chemotherapy, the bone marrow, the factory, is damaged as well as the cancer. And this leads to low blood counts. Low blood counts leads to infection, leads to bleeding, and leads to serious injury. And this is what the bone marrow looks like in a person who has been given chemotherapy. So here again, for comparison on the lower panel, is this very rich, lots of cells in the, in the relatively uh, normal or untreated marrow. But these top panels show that the bone marrow has been damaged significantly by chemotherapy, and the ability to make blood is reduced. And uh, you can see uh, in that situation the need for transplantation, that is, if you could give more treatment to a patient, more chemotherapy, and somehow get around the damage to the bone marrow, then you would have a useful uh, modality. And in fact, that's what bone marrow transplant is. It's basically a rescue. The idea is that the, the, the bone marrow that you're giving back restores blood production, and you can make the blood cells uh, get back to normal, fight off infection, fight off bleeding, and, and help the patient during this very difficult time. There are many kinds of bone marrow transplants. You've certainly read about it. Hollywood makes a lot of movies. Um, bone marrow can be collected from the bone marrow itself, or as I'll show you on a subsequent uh, couple slides, the field has evolved that uh, we are able to fool the bone marrow 
by giving patients chem, chem, uh, different agents, and the bone marrow cells that normally stay in the bone marrow will leave the bone marrow, go out into the blood, and it's a lot easier to collect blood from uh, an individual than to have to put a needle into their hip, and I'll show you what this looks like from a technical standpoint. Now, the two major distinctions are donating your bone marrow for yourself. There are situations where you can give your own bone marrow, or there are situations where you can get it from a brother or a sister who is the same bone marrow type, or even someone in the community at large. This is referred to the, the lady that introduced me. The term is, she used the term allogeneic. That means from another person. And there are people in the world, somewhere in the world, who may have the same bone marrow type as you. The problem is the likelihood of finding a donor, as I'll show you on a cartoon, is much more common in your immediate family than in the world at large, but nonetheless, it's possible. Now, the bone marrow cells all start from one cell. There's a great-grandfather cell that we call a stem cell that lives in the bone marrow. And this cell will grow and divide and ultimately give rise to all blood production. So from this New Yorker cartoon, I'm joking that one scoop of ice cream can lead to many, many different products. And that term is differentiation. Um, it's a little bit more complicated when you show in actuality, as the red arrow shows up here, the grandfather cell, this stem cell that gives rise to all blood production that lives in the bone marrow is a very complicated cell, but this is the cells, this is the cell we want, and if we transfer this cell, you can restore blood production to the person uh, in, who's in need of, this, of the uh, bone marrow transplant. And the, the different kinds of transplants are again showed here on this slide. We match bone marrow uh, very differently than we match red blood cells. So those of you who have gone to blood banks and know your blood type is O or it's AB or it's O, uh, red, red blood cells have not, uh, uh, typing and bone marrow typing are very, very different. People can be matched uh, through a much more complicated system that is called HLA. But also, as I've described to you, people who are not related to you, somewhere in the world may have the same bone marrow type as you. And this uh, is, is the, forms the background for how we proceed with transplantation. Now, in my career, um, we started out trying to figure out what drugs we could use that we could expand and give in much higher doses to kill off more, chemo more cancer. Again, what I showed you is more chemotherapy kills more cancer, and if you can support the person, you could cure more cancers. The problem is we don't want to lose patients due to marrow failure from infection, bleeding, or other things. One of the first drugs that we started with is shown here. This is a drug called cytarabine. This is a, uh, a, a drug that's given by vein, and it's very commonly used in the treatment of leukemia. We, in the, late, in the mid and the late 1970s, at Case Western Reserve University, systematically started a series of studies in many, many patients with end-of-the-line leukemia where we were able to demonstrate that we could give higher and higher doses of this particular drug to these patients where we ended up uh, interestingly, not only getting rid of the leukemia in some of these people, but actually curing these patients of this very dreaded disease by giving, as I showed on this slide, 30 times the dose that was given before. And this was a, was a clue that this approach of intensive treatment was going to be something that people should start. And in fact, right now, uh, this approach um, with high-dose cytarabine is standard treatment. So I've had an opportunity to participate in developing something that's standard around the world. Now, similarly, people started looking in the early 1980s at transplantation, not only for bone marrow, but for other uh, organs, as you can see here on this uh, cover of Newsweek, from 1983. As, as the medical science got further and further, understanding more and more about how the body can tolerate an organ from one person, versus an organ from another. Well, we did the science of immunology. Uh, more and more transplants uh, were done. And in fact, the University of Pittsburgh, not very far from here, became the world's leader in liver transplants and solid organ transplants of that nature. That was in the early 1980s. And this slide shows you that transplantation has exploded. So if we look back here on the, on the uh, horizontal axis in the 1970s, 
transplants were not done very commonly, and over a period of time, many, many more transplants were being done, uh, in part from results that we had and others had published, showing that you could use your own bone marrow, that's in the uh, gray area, the, that's the word autologous, and other uh, marrow from other people uh, and, and different types of cells to the point that we're now starting to cure people who really were going to die of their disease in a very short time. And this is, uh, these are data I'll show you. These are called survival curves. I'll show a few of these. This graphs the, the likelihood or the percent of patients surviving on the vertical axis as a function of the time, time zero being when you did the transplant, onward in months or years, or in this case, in decades. Uh, we were the first group who took people that had essentially end-of-the-line lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma and other kinds of lymphoma, and used bone marrow transplant after high doses of chemotherapy. We were only able to cure 20% of these end-of-the-line patients, but that's 20% of people who would have died from their disease. And right now, this is one of the standards uh, of, of how to approach people who have lymphoma that has come back after a conventional chemotherapy. Now the field has been moving forward, and you can see on this curve that, and, and history tends to repeat itself as we are all familiar with the, uh, the nuclear disaster in Japan just recently. This was the story of Chernobyl, where over in Russia there was a big uh, nuclear accident and a, a large number of people were exposed to radiation. And actually a very close friend of mine, Robert Peter Gale, was the American physician who went over to uh, Russia to do transplantation. And this captivated the world, and people started noticing that transplantation was potentially a curative, a curative option. You can see this is from Life magazine in 1986, such that now this is standard fare in many places around the world, that transplantation not only is it curative for getting rid of cancer, but it can also get rid of marrow that's been damaged from radiation accidents, from immunologic diseases, or from... Uh, inborn errors. There are people that are born with immune systems that don't work. So that's how we, we have gotten to where we are. I mentioned earlier that the way we collect, we used to collect bone marrow was a very arduous process where an individual, you can see this person is lying on his or her side and uh, Novocaine and, a, and a, is put into the hip bone in the back and then you can see that the needle is directed through that bone into the area where it's uh, sucked out with a syringe. And it's relatively uncomfortable to have this done, so this is done with people put to sleep. We don't do this anymore. In the mid and late 1980s, we and other centers uh, figured out a way to fool the bone marrow, to throw bone marrow cells out into the blood, and to collect them in the blood. And that's shown on this cartoon. So what you can see on this, the term is mobilization. So the red line here is a blood vessel that has all these cells in it. And with the uh, uh, bone marrow being uh, it, uh, tickled or, or provoked in a certain fashion, the white bone marrow cells leave the bone marrow, go into, you can see the arrow, they leave the bone marrow, they go into the blood vessel, and we collect them using automated instruments and don't have to put people to sleep. And as a result of that, we can actually collect much more bone marrow cells. So this is sort of the, the, the distillate of the major technologic advances. Where have we gone? Why have we gotten so much better? Transplantation is now done throughout the world with high degrees of success. We have been able to um, develop newer chemotherapeutic agents, as I'll show you. Um, we are able to make it safer and easier for patients to get through chemotherapy. We have uh, had uh, experiences in developing new anti-nausea medications that people are not nearly as sick as they used to be. And of course, we have not only better uh, antibiotics and better ways of giving blood transfusions, but also we have many, many more donors, as I'll show you on another slide. Now, one of the ways, the tr one of the tricks of getting the bone marrow cells to leave the bone marrow and to go into the blood is to give them, is to give the recipient or the patient growth factors. Now, this is not gonna make you grow taller or, great, or have you grow, grow great muscles like Arnold Schwarzenegger. These are uh, substances that exist in all of us 
but in very, very, very tiny quality, quantities, such that with marvels of genetic engineering, we're able to take the gene that makes these substances, put them into a bacteria, and grow up large numbers of this, this material in tissue culture, purify it, and then make it available, as shown here on this slide, to be able to give these products to, uh, to patients and have this happen. We're also able to administer a lot of these treatments much more uh, easily and readily and with less discomfort for the patient by doing what's using what's called a central venous catheter. What this means is that instead of, and you may all have had this experience, of having somebody stick a needle in your hand or in your arm or starting an IV on a regular basis, a surgeon can very uh, uh, succinctly put in a a uh, catheter, this plastic tube, right under the front of the chest that can stay under the skin, that's what the dotted line means, under the skin, and then this catheter can be used to give all the blood transfusions and the antibiotics and all the things that's necessary. Now I'm going to show you the two major classes of transplant in some of the data. So autologous means self-transplant you are donating blood cells for yourself. This is a, a very a complicated area. Just understand that there are people in whom we can collect the normal blood cells and not collect bad cells. We can freeze those cells and give them back. This is uh, an advantageous because you don't have to go look for a donor. The cells are not going to be rejected because they're yours. But there, is, uh, there are some side effects or downside to this, partly because uh, many of the people that were collecting bone marrow cells have already been exposed to chemotherapy and the cells may have been damaged. And this is the cartoon of how this works. You identify a patient who is a candidate for a transplant for him, himself or herself. We collect the cells out of the blood as I've described to you, then freeze the cells, then give the patients very high doses of chemotherapy, then go to the freezer, take the cells out of the freezer, thaw them, give them back, and as a transfusion, the cells know to go through the bloodstream and home back into the bone marrow and start to grow. They do not grow instantaneously. They usually take about two or three weeks to grow back. This is why people have to be hospitalized and have to get antibiotics to prevent or treat infection and have to give, get blood transfusions because they're not making blood. But when that is all worn off, then hopefully the disease has come under good control. Now, again, in the course of my career, we were able to develop one of these drugs to the point that it, this drug is now used worldwide for the treatment of certain malignancies. We took a drug that had been uh, underutilized and used in very low dose, Melphalan, that's shown uh, here in this uh, uh, product, and this is a drug uh, that works by uh, killing the DNA of uh, tumor cells. That's what this, sh this panel here shows. It's a very active drug. We were able to demonstrate through a series of, of many, many studies in patients that we could give almost 10 times the dose of this drug when we gave the patients their own bone marrow back. And this resulted in a much, much higher likelihood of getting rid of the malignancy. This was such a sentinel event that the initial report that I wrote, which is shown up here, in 1983 was recognized by one of the prestigious medical societies that 25 years later uh, they asked my permission to republish the original article from 1983 in its form and asked and, and ask me and my colleagues to provide an editorial of, of, of what, what has happened in the ensuing 25 years and we did this. This is now standard fare for people that have uh, certain kinds of malignancy, especially multiple myeloma, which is a very devastating illness. <clears throat> Pardon me. The other uh, uh, area that we have spent a lot of time improving is in the area of allogeneic transplant. So very different than using cells from yourself. Allogeneic means you have to have somebody who's a donor, or first of all, willing to be a donor, and next of all, has the same bone marrow type as you. If we took somebody who did not have the same bone marrow type and gave them 
gave your bone, their bone marrow to you, it wouldn't grow, it would be rejected. So you need some kind of matching, it has to be the same. These are cells from a normal donor, that's an advantage. And these cells from the normal person have the ability to recognize and kill cancer cells, which is something that is lacking in a person who gets cells from themselves, the autologous, or they wouldn't have had cancer developed in the first place. So there's advantages of using another person, but the disadvantages not only made these cells from the normal person attack the cancer, but they might recognize that person's liver or intestines or skin as being different and cause an attack. That is known as graft versus host disease. That's shown here on this slide. Graft, meaning the cells from the other person. Host is the recipient. And this is a problem. So how do we know somebody's a match? Well, this, car this cartoon and the cartoon in the next slide show that the bone marrow uh, type, much like red blood cell type or other things, uh, the ABO example that I gave you, is inherited. So on this cartoon, the round circles are, are females and the square circles are men. So here we have a man and a woman that have three children. And these long addresses I've made color-coded so you can see the difference. This is how we uh, talk about the bone marrow type. It's a very complicated system, but you can see from this cartoon that mom and dad come together and each parent gives one gene to each of their children so each so everybody has two genes and in this case the mom gives the red gene to her daughter and the and the red gene to the son while dad gives the green gene to the same uh, 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 daughter and son and there's a match you can see that light up and this brother over here who's not affected doesn't match but that doesn't matter so we have a good situation we can do a transplant between the brother and the patient. On the other hand, here's a situation where they don't match up, uh, where you can see that mom and dad's genetic uh, situation was such that the two brothers match each other, but the patient is left out in the cold. What does that mean? Well, I've already told you that there's many, many people in the world uh, who may have the same bone marrow type as you. The problem is it's like needle in a haystack. Over the last several decades, Places, uh, agencies like the Department of Defense, the Navy, uh, over in Europe, there's a whole bunch of, a whole number of agencies. They have screened normal donors so that there's 15 million altruistic people in the world who we have their DNA typing on and we know what their bone marrow type is. You can dial up, literally on a computer, to find somebody. So if it's one in a million chance of finding somebody out there and there's 15 million, you may not have a brother or sister who's a donor, but you might have an unrelated donor. And this is how we're able to do this sort of thing. The chronology of doing a transplant between a brother and a sister or someone who's unrelated and a patient is shown here. It's a little bit different than what I showed you for the, um, the autologous situation because now we have two individuals involved. We, the red is the patient, and you can see in this case the patient is evaluated the patient's going to get very high doses of chemotherapy to get rid of the cancer, and the patient's going to get a graft. But it's not the person's own graft that's been collected before. It's from the donor who has to be uh, agreeable, and we, don't, we certainly don't want to put the donor at risk. And, and <clears throat> Pardon me. This is why there's so many safeguards in place, and, and this is done worldwide uh, with very, very few ba uh, bad things happening to a normal person who's... Uh, of, of course, uh, we have to protect them at all costs. And then we do the transplant by giving the cells back, giving that person antibiotics and transfusions until the bone marrow can grow back. And one other wrinkle here, we have to remember that the cells from the other person can attack the person in question, graft versus host disease. We have to take steps to pre prevent that from happening. And you can see, much like I showed you in an earlier slide, the worldwide donation history has exploded. There are millions and millions of people who donate blood or bone marrow for uh, their fellow uh, uh, mankind. And in fact, there's even uh, umbilical cord blood, uh, which I'll comment on in a second. Now, just to run through some of these data, this is a very brief series of survival curves. This is one of the uh, studies that we showed. 
that we're able to cure about half of the people with uh, lymphoma that's relapsed after treatment. Remember the first study I showed you, we were only about successful in 20%. Now we're successful in more than half of the people that have this disease. I wish I could tell you that uh, we could do this in everybody. It's a little harder to do it in older people and not el all the elderly are the same. For those of you in the audience, that's Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. If you don't know that and the other ones, I hope you can recognize. But we have been able to, um, to, to, with better supportive care, better antibiotics, better transfusions, the growth factors and other things, do this in even much older folks where this was never done before, leading to much success. And, and I'll skip that slide other than to show you that in the past uh, few decades, we've gotten better and better and better at doing this. These are just a series of curves showing that uh, the likelihood of surviving and uh, these diseases is getting better and better, except the big hurdle still is this graft versus host disease. This is a cartoon showing it's the agony and the ecstasy. Graft versus host disease is good. The graft attacking the cancer, normal cells getting rid of the cancer. It's bad because the graft sometimes may attack the recipient and the cells may not grow. So that's still the holy grail. Uh, much like in the Middle East, there can be tolerance and detente or whatever topic, you, whatever language you want to use. Uh, it takes a long time. If a person gets a transplant from another person and you can keep them going uh, and out of the hospital, usually over a period of a number of years, the war between the, the um, donor's bone marrow and the person uh, goes away. That's what's shown on this slide, the term tolerance. You can see how the, this graft versus host disease eventually distinct, uh, extinguishes. And these slides just remind us that people who get some graft versus host disease are going to do better because the disease, the malignancy, is killed off by the graft. Now, to make it even more complicated but better for patients, we're not, we figured out we don't, in some people, have to give as much treatment. And I'm going to quote Shakespeare, uh, where a little more than a little is by much too much. This basically means that there are some situations where if it's, uh, a situation of, of doing a transplant between two different people, we may not have to give all of the chemotherapy at the same time to get rid of the malignancy. So to put it in, in football terms, if it's second down and 20 yards to go, you don't have to get it all in one play. Maybe you can get it on 10 yards and 10 yards and get a first down. And that's what's shown here on this cartoon. The idea here in, in is now we use what's called reduced intensity conditioning transplant. In other words, the transplant is not as intense as it has been because the idea is that you give enough chemotherapy to allow the patient's immune system not to reject the graft and, not, and, and still killing off cells so that you get a partial engraftment or some of the cells are growing. So the donor is in red, uh, I'm sorry, is in yellow, the donor is in red and you can see that after, in the first few weeks or the first few months, the person has a mixture of their own bone marrow and the, and the marrow of, uh, that, they, uh, uh, that they got from the donor. But over a period of time, their own bad cells go away and eventually the graft is uh, from the other person and has gotten rid of the cells. When that is done, it is much safer for the recipient. And today, we're able to, through better understanding of immunology, we're able to provide a graft for almost everybody. I'm sure you remember uh, a hearing or seeing in the newspaper or on TV, somebody's brother or sister didn't match and that was almost the end of the world. Not true. Volunteer donors and other things, I'll show you a brief bit about uh, umbilical cord blood grafts. The unrelated donors, because of the way we understand matching, are providing almost as good a result as a brother or sister. That's what this curve shows. These curves, the brother or sister graft and the unrelated donor graft are almost superimposable. And we have even the, uh, the issue of collecting uh, grafts from the placenta, the afterbirth. This is when a baby is delivered, the umbilical cord is tied off, and the afterbirth is delivered. Remember the placenta, the afterbirth, is the machine 
in the mother's womb that keeps the baby alive. It's, it, it provides all the nutrients and all the blood and all these other things. That was formerly discarded. Now, uh, these uh, cells can be collected by the obstetrician after the baby has been delivered. They can be frozen and they, can, they too can be used. And this is a curve basically showing that you can do this kind of transplant and have very, very successful outcomes. There is still some work, a lot of work to be done. I've mentioned graft versus host disease. Also, people who undergo a transplant tend to have uh, problems with acceleration of the aging process. That means they get cataracts at a younger age, they have uh, dental caries, they get osteoporosis at a younger age. They have a lot of things that happen to them, but we're working on that area. In the few remaining minutes of my talk, I wanted to share with you another stem cell area that I've been fortunate to spend in my career uh, that has been uh, a very, very rewarding and is part of my, some of my new duties. This is an area where we recognized uh, on the campus at Case Western Reserve University that there's not only a grandfather cell in the bone marrow, the stem cell, that makes blood, but there's a grandfather cell in the bone marrow that's referred to as a mesenchymal stem cell. This is a cell that makes the supporting area for the bone marrow. In other words, this is a cell that, that makes the house in which the people live. The bone marrow is the people living in the house. The house is the, the bone or the skeleton. And we can collect these cells from the bone marrow. And in fact, we can grow them up. This is one of the un unusual properties of these cells. You can take a small amount of bone marrow from a normal person, put it into the laboratory, and grow it up as shown here in this cartoon. So you can see here, in this test tube, the red bone marrow is put into a centrifuge. The cells we want are in green, and over a period of, of uh, many weeks, huge numbers of these cells can be uh, grown up and frozen. And this is what they look like under the microscope. When you put them into culture, they stick to the bottom of the tissue of the flask, and they look like these little spindly things, and they multiply so that you can see that now this whole plate is filled and they're stuck to each other. We can collect these cells and then use them for treatment. What do they do? They nurture the bone marrow. And this is shown here in this experiment. The term is cobblestoning. This is a picture from um, one of the cobblestone streets in Germany when I was there recently. Basically, this is what the cells look like growing. If you add the bone marrow stem cells on top of these mesenchymal stem cells, they grow and make many, many colonies of bone marrow. This is called cobblestoning. They look similar to what's in the street. And they also have immunosuppressive properties. This is the first time this has been done in humans. This is a paper that I wrote um, almost, uh, it's more than 15 years ago. The first time this had ever been tried in people, we collected bone marrow cells, we grew the mesenchymal cells, and gave them the cells to the people, again, with informed consent, to see how they would, see if this was possible. Yes, it was possible in this first in human study. And subsequently, we have gone on and used these cells as part of our therapeutic armamentarium. These cells will help bone marrow uh, grow faster and suppress graft versus host disease. So this is another uh, example of the first in human study. This is when we uh, took these cells from the brother who gave the bone marrow for the transplant in these patients. And these studies have all been published uh, in a series of um, in articles. This is the, the last one I'm going to show you. This is uh, um, shown here, basically indicating that the dreaded graft versus host disease, that is, the cells from the donor attacking the liver, attacking the kidney, attacking the skin, etc. This did not happen. That's what this means. No graft versus host disease. Grade zero, no graft versus host disease. And this is another one of those survival plots showing that in this large number of patients predominantly with leukemia that we were able to cure these people. So this has been a fantastic uh, experience. This technology has now been uh, readily exported to places all over the world. We've had people 
come to Case Western Reserve University to learn how to do this and go back to their respective countries. And that's shown here on this slide. You can see that right now, worldwide, there's more than 100 countries that have started doing mesenchymal stem cell expansion and transplantation. It's been a very uh, lucrative thing from the uh, technology, technologic uh, startup company's perspective. More than 5,000 patients have been treated, and this is another area in which I've been very fortunate to work. So I wanted to take another uh, minute or so to thank uh, all the people who have been involved in these efforts. Um, certainly, um, the patients and families, we could never have made so much progress in the diagnosis and treatment of some of these blood cancers if it were not for the very brave patients and their families who were willing to uh, go through a lot of these very difficult times and now everybody's seeing the benefits of this kind of thing. And a lot of the data uh, also has, um, have been, have been uh, uh, that I've shown have been generated at other centers and building. And so this is a famous quote from Sir Isaac Newton who said, if I have seen farther than others, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. So I think that's something that's very important. But again, I wanted to conclude by uh, coming back to my point about Carnegie Mellon, uh, the We Can Do, uh, showing the logo here. Um, I, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart all the people, you at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I think it's helped instill the spirit of discovery in me, not only the professors and the academic staff, but also my fellow students, and certainly from the philanthropic support of the alumni and friends. Uh, you have established the Carnegie Mellon culture. This is a wonderful campus where ideas and, uh, become reality and nobody wants to go home at the end of the day without having some success and building. So I want to thank you for your attention and again, thank you for uh, uh, your uh, helping me get to where I am. Anybody have any questions on what I went through? Yes. Um, how do you harvest the mesenchymal cells? The cells? So um, the mesenchymal cells can be, I, for the purposes of this audience, I uh, wanted to spare you some of those details. Um, the mesenchymal stem cells can be collected from a variety of tissues. Uh, we at, at Case Western Reserve University have tended to collect them from a small amount of bone marrow, where again, if everybody in the audience takes their thumb and puts it on the back of your hip, you can feel that bone sticking out there. That's where we go. That's called the posterior superior crest. If you put a person on the side, as I showed you, and clean off that area and put in Novocaine, you can put in a small needle with a syringe and collect a small amount of bone marrow and then put that bone marrow after the cells have been purified into culture and add various things and these small numbers of cells will grow. You can also do this with fat. You can literally take fat off somebody. Uh, you can do this from, uh, from placenta fluid. It's, there's a lot of different tissues and a lot of commercial ventures have actually sprung up trying to grow up these cells for marketing and there's companies that have catchy names that are actually doing this. I, I, you know, I, I think it's um, it, it's an exciting area. I don't know what the best recipe is. We like to use bone marrow, and that's, in fact, what we tend to do. Yes? The bone marrow transplant does not work. Can you do another one from, from another donor, and what's the probability of that being successful? So I'll repeat your question. Your question is, if the first bone marrow transplant doesn't work, can you do another bone marrow transplant? So the long answer is, number one, why didn't the first bone marrow transplant work? Did the cancer grow too fast and you couldn't catch up? Did the bone marrow that you put in didn't grow? Or did the person have something bad happen, like graft versus host disease? So depending on what the answer was, you may or may not be able to do a second transplant. Now, if it's your own bone marrow that you're donating, where you got a cancer, but it's under control, you can collect the cells. You're relying with your own cells on chemotherapy in massive dose 
to get rid of the cancer. That doesn't always work. So some people who have had a bone marrow transplant using their own cells are now a candidate to get a bone marrow transplant from, with someone else's cells, whether it's a brother or a sister or someone in the community at large. And that, in fact, is done somewhat frequently. So that's a fairly common, that's called a tandem transplant. When a person has had a bone marrow transplant that has not worked after getting an allogeneic transplant, that is from brother or sister, the likelihood of then being able to get another transplant is, is less common. It can be done. Sometimes another donor can be used, but I would say on average, I would say maybe of all the cases, it's a 5%. So yeah, it can be done, but you have to understand why the first transplant was not a success. Other questions? All right, well, thank you. Enjoy the weekend, and thank you for this honoring once again.